Okay, well, this is an overview of asset allocation. So what are we allocating the funds to? Well, we're allocating them to asset classes. Now, the traditional definition of an asset class is here, is simply a group of assets with similar investment characteristics. Uh, we're going to see shortly we, that we can create some super asset classes, you know, the most high level categorization. Uh, there are going to be capital investments, and we've also got consumables, followed by stores of value. So, really, that is the highest level possible that we can categorize assets with different characteristics. Now clearly we can subdefine or we can get even more granular within each one. So with capital assets, that's gonna be things like equities and bonds, consumables, you know, commodities, and stores of value are gonna be things like precious metals. But at the, the highest possible level, that's what we're talking about, uh, really when we talk about asset classes. And an important takeaway for you at this point is that the decision on how much of the portfolio to allocate to each asset class it is the most important decision. It's the fundamental determinant of the portfolio's risk exposures and really the fundamental determinant of the portfolio's overall performance. Um, we can manage the asset class weight so we can you know, increase or decrease the proportion to equity, increase or decrease the proportion to bonds, etc., etc., in order to manage the risk profile of the investments. Okay, so. What should asset classes have as attributes? We've got a couple of slides here which are going to run through the basics of what makes up a suitable asset class. Well, assets within each class should be relatively homogenous. Okay, they should be similar uh, to each other. So similar to descriptive and statistical attributes. Uh, so things like equities, everything under equities will have similar attributes. You know, they're, um, they're going to pay some dividends, some of them perhaps. Uh, they represent ownership of companies, you know, the basics. Uh, bonds, you know, fixed income securities, there's going to be some that pay a coupon, some that don't. But essentially they're debt finance, aren't they? So each of the individual securities within each asset class should be relatively similar to each other. And the classes shouldn't overlap. Okay, so they should be mutually exclusive. So within equities, we could define two sub-asset classes as being US and non-US, UK, non-UK, European and Asian. Well, there shouldn't be any overlap between them, and clearly there wouldn't be uh, with these categories here. And an individual security, an individual asset, shouldn't fit into more than one class. Okay, so if you've got shares in a, a big Australian company, well, that would be Australian equity. It wouldn't fit into US equity. Uh, it should go without saying. The classes shouldn't be highly correlated with themselves. Okay, so if they if they are highly correlated, then you're not going to get the diversification benefits that you uh, that you want from splitting the portfolio across different asset classes. Um, so if you've got two asset classes that are highly positively correlated, well, really, are they not just the same asset class in that case? Okay, so uh, definitely uh, less than positive, uh, perfect positive correlation uh, is required. Otherwise, the assets uh, are just the same. Uh, they should cover the majority of the world investable assets. So if our definitions, if our big list of asset classes has missed out a big chunk of assets that can be investable somewhere in the world, well then something's missing. Okay, We need to define what's missing. We need to put what's missing into another asset class. And these asset classes are going to be utterly useless if they're not investable. It's all very well defining an asset class, but if you can't actually invest in um, securities which are going to meet that asset class's risk and return attributes, um, then we're really missing out on something important. Okay, so a little bit earlier we talked about super asset classes. It's impossible to have a wider definition of asset classes than what's down here. So capital assets, consumables, and stores of value. Uh, capital assets would be things like equities and bonds, so they can be valued as the present value of the future cash flows. Okay, so it's perfectly possible to value a share, you remember from your level one and two studies, uh, based on the present value of future dividends uh, discounted the investor's required rate of return. Likewise with bonds, present value of future coupons and uh, principal redemption discounted at the market's yield. Uh, so capital assets, the traditional asset classes that I'm sure we're, we're used to. Consumables or transformables like commodities, uh, so things like wheat, oil, orange juice, pork bellies, uh, all those. And then stores of value, currencies and precious metals uh, would fall into those categories there. Now, those super asset classes, unlikely to be very important or super important uh, in the exam. Okay, in the exam, we tend to be looking at asset classes down a little bit more uh, on the granular scale. So things like domestic and international equities, domestic and international fixed income. Don't forget alternatives, 
Okay, so we've got real estate here, private equity, and commodities. Okay, in later readings, we're going to be looking at lots of those uh, in much more detail. Okay, I mentioned granularity a second ago. Let's just define what that means. Basically, increasing granularity, you can see the arrow uh, going along the slide there, um, means that we are splitting that asset class up into smaller and more specifically defined sections. Okay, so our very low granular asset class there is equities. Okay, full stop, equities, all equities all over the world. Well, let's split it up into domestic and international. From a US perspective, that'd be US and non-US. And then we can further split up those categories into large cap and small cap, mid cap if you want as well. Uh, maybe international to be developed and emerging economies and so on and so on. So uh, as you increase the granularity, um, much more specific and the, uh, the amount of assets in each class begins to, to decrease. Really from a strategic asset allocation perspective, we don't tend to do much granularity. Uh, really the, uh, the most granular we would get would be domestic and international equities, domestic and international bonds. Uh, of course, the, the examiners reserve the right uh, to examine anything they want, uh, but mainly the broader asset classes will be what we're concerned about. Um, more granular subclasses, as it says here on the right-hand side, less distinct in characteristics. Okay, so um, really the more granular you get, the individual securities in that asset class are well, almost identical, might be pushing it, but you take the point. Okay, there's not much difference uh, between securities in there. Um, where the strategic asset allocation focuses on low granular classes, tactical asset allocation uh, would look at those you know, individual securities and those very finely defined uh, classes of asset. Okay, shifting focus just for um, a short while now. Um, asset classes themselves don't give you the full picture about the risks that you're exposed to. If you think about what really drives investment performance in the real world, risk drivers, uh, we'd be talking about things like well, volatility, uh, liquidity, inflation, interest rates, duration, and so on and so on. Now we'll call these risk factors. And an investor might decide that they want to be exposed to a greater or lesser extent to one or more of these risk factors. Okay? The more risk you take, ideally, you earn a risk premium. Uh, so there's potential different returns on offer when you vary the level of exposure to each risk factor. Um, the problem with this approach to investing, though, is that risk factors aren't directly investable. And if we've got an idea that we want a certain exposure to volatility or a certain exposure to, to foreign exchange, well, when we look at each individual asset class in turn, there's a bit of overlap in terms of which risk factors each class is exposed to. So let's just, for argument's sake, take these two asset classes here at the bottom of our slide. And over on the right-hand side, we've got risk factors which drive return. So I might decide that I want to be exposed to foreign exchange to a certain extent, volatility and liquidity to a certain extent. It's very difficult, actually, to then look at traditional asset classes and vary the weightings. The reason for that is that, well, foreign exchange is going to be exposed, or you're going to be exposed to it, in both equity and fixed income. So it's difficult to vary your level of foreign exchange just by looking at domestic equity and domestic fixed income. Although you might assume that, actually, if we're in domestic equities, we're not exposed to foreign exchange. Well, that's not really true, because the individual companies, the individual, individual securities that you're investing in, they're going to have foreign exchange exposure. So you are going to be exposed to it to a certain extent. The same with domestic fixed income. Volatility would also affect the returns on both of those assets, as would liquidity. Okay. So if we're taking a risk factor approach, it's going to be quite tricky, not impossible, but it's going to be quite tricky to just get our exposures to each factor just right uh, by looking at individual asset classes like this. Okay, as we said before, it's difficult just to invest in volatility. It's difficult just to inf invest in inflation. But you can synthesize exposures to just one individual risk factor uh, by using multi-factor models and factor portfolios. Okay, so a good example of this would be, let's say I want to expose myself to inflation risk. Okay, well, how can I do that? Well, we can do it with a long, short portfolio. Okay, so if we go long treasury bonds, so there's some fixed income, we're going long on treasuries, uh, treasuries are subject to inflation risk, of course. If inflation goes up, the, the real value of your treasury bond is going to go down. Okay. If, though, at the same time we short inflation-linked treasuries, so we've gone long on treasuries and we've shorted inflation-linked, basically what we're left with is just that exposure to inflation risk. Okay. Now, if we'd gone long inflation-linked treasuries, they do better 
when inflation goes up. The fact that we're shorting inflation like treasuries means our portfolio is going to do better when inflation falls. And every other risk factor in common that our normal treasuries and our inflation linked treasuries have is offset. We've gone long the treasuries, we've gone short the treasuries. All that's left is that exposure to inflation risk. So a combination of long short portfolios can be used to isolate and synthesize exposure to those individual risk factors. That being said, the main focus of the CFA exam is on exposure to traditional asset classes. Um, so although an awareness of factor-based uh, asset allocation is worthwhile, uh, we wouldn't expect as many questions in the exam to be on that. Um, in a short while, we're going to be talking about how to decide on the optimal asset allocation. We're going to be looking at mean variance optimization. You can use mean variance optimizers for both factor-based and traditional asset classes. Um, in the real world and in academia, we wouldn't say that either is superior. Um, really, the, the best approach should reflect how the client and the individual portfolio manager think about investment risk. If they don't think about it in terms of risk factors, then it doesn't really make much sense to have a factor-based approach. Um, ultimately, though, we'll be expecting more traditional asset allocation measures rather than factor-based uh, measures to be examined uh, in Level 3.